morning and welcome back to the symposium Shared Ground Cross-Disciplinary Approaches to Craft Studies. My name is Elisa Alter, I'm the Wingate Research Curator here at the Museum of Arts and Design and a visiting associate professor at the Bart Graduate Center. Today's first session picks up on the theme Learning and Crossing, which was introduced yesterday at Bart Graduate Center. And in that session, we heard papers on the role of quilting in activism and transatlantic diplomacy the overlap of craft and science and the development of scientific reasoning, and how the concept of authenticity is marshaled across different political, cultural, and social contexts. However, I noticed that papers throughout the day touched on craft's ability to cut across binaries such as that dividing the natural from the artificial, or the human and the non-human, or deflate hierarchies of value that make distinctions between official and unofficial histories and archives, or applied and pure research. So I think we're gonna have a seamless transition to today's first session, which focuses again on forms of border crossing, um, this time as collaborations between institutions and cross-disciplinary pedagogical experiments. The first session will be uh, chaired by Alicia Ori de Nicola, who's a member of the working group, um, and we got to know her research um, yesterday. We break at 12.15, and at that time, Matt's chief curator, Shannon Stratton, and assistant curator, Barbara Paris Gifford, will be giving back-to-back -to -back tours of the exhibitions on the second and third floors of the museum. Here are those two exhibitions. On the third, it's a new acquisition exhibition on the second floor, La Frontera, a jewelry exhibition about the border between the uh, United States and Mexico, and a solo show of the work of Tanya Aguiniga. So this is gonna be a little bit complicated, so let me walk you through it slowly. Everyone has a choice of one of the two tours listed here. Um, on the back of your badge, if you have a red sticker, <laughs> pick a tour, pick one of these tours, and then meet on the corresponding floor at 12.30 p.m. If you have a yellow sticker on the back of your badge, pick a tour and meet on the corresponding floor at 1 p.m. Um, does that make sense? I can explain it one-on-one. -on -one. Later. <laughs> You're uh, the second session begins today at 2.30 p.m. and is titled Unsettling Coloniality, Resources and Strategies for New Teaching Models and Pedagogies. The session includes Lisa Weinbaum and another member of our symposium working group, Namita de Wiggers, who will also chair the session. This session combines a scholarly and applied focus to the writing and teaching of craft histories, playing critical attention to its role in various forms of colonialism, and its complex legacies today. Now, in preparation for that session, Manita has an informal assignment, and she's gonna explain that before we break for the tours and lunch. So after the discussion following the first session, Manita, you'll come up, I have a slide for you that you can walk people through, okay. Um, again, today's proceedings are being recorded in live to capture quotes and images and other content on social media using Hashtag Shared Ground 2018. Now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to reintroduce Alicia, who is an Associate Professor of Anthropology at Oxford College of Emory University. Um, please join me in welcoming her to the podium. about creating ways for students to learn from doing. All of these talks teach us 
how to refuse to let existing understandings of institutions and spaces restrain good teaching. Leah Matthews talks to us about co-creating across time, space, and discipline, while also speaking to different generations and about often discordant subjects. Hideo Mabuchi uses play to help him teach physics and the scientific process, and yesterday he told me that for at least some of his students, this clay work is one of the most difficult things that they do at the university. He teaches physics. <laughs> <laughs> Ned Cook will tell us about using low te a low technology shop that concentrates on process rather than the finished product to teach material literacy. And Jeremy McGowan reimagines the museum as open source, transitory, and deeply rooted in a process of indigenizing the dominant museum space. So I hope you enjoy all of those speeches. Um, and I will uh, now give it to the um, is the Thank you, Alicia. And uh, like others before me, I want to thank the generous uh, conference organizers for bringing together a really fascinating array of practitioners. I'm, it's an honor to be among them. Um, so today, I want, will share Ravel Unravel, a project co-designed one year ago by myself, a New York and Athens-based curator and educator, leaders of the two states in Georgia, not to be mixed up with the peach state. <laughs> Uh, here was our challenge. How does a curatorial project aim to be undervalued and yet exceptionally vital Georgian textile museum more visible to both, both local and global audiences? Our goal was to create a dialogical platform, specifically a provocative exhibition coupled with a series of hands-on workshops that would engage multi-generational participants and audiences. In short, we wanted to cross the range of boundaries, national, historical, disciplinary, generational, in an effort to catalyze a much needed dialogue about the activities and objects lodged within <coughs> this painfully overlooked silk museum. To set this undertaking into a broader context, it's important to note that for me, curating internationally is not only focused on creating a contemporary exhibition alone. It also in, uh, involves envisioning a two-way exchange uh, platform, uh, always developed in collaboration with a professional counterpart who lives and works locally. Since 2005, I brought more than 50 US-based artists and designers to Georgia to realize 10 projects on ridiculously tiny budgets. That's the norm in this economically challenged country with no tradition of cultural philanthropy. So my key criteria for selecting artists is no divas allowed, and you have to want to learn from the post-Soviet world. Because these are collaborative uh, ventures, the, uh, themes respond to local conditions. Inevitably, they address psychic and material fallout from the shift between Georgia's uh, Soviet and Russian-occupied past towards its new globalized neoliberal capitalist agenda which insists on mass consumerism, uh, privatization, and the championing of new technologies. This rapid sociopolitical transformation, for better and for worse, has happened at breakneck speed since the 2004 Rose Revolution. Uh, so Georgians constantly are finding themselves critiquing what is uh, being lost and what's being gained in their new normal. Uh, that said, my Georgian collaborators are always eager to enter into debates with others who challenge their and expand their aesthetic assumptions. And of course, they want to harness new flowing monies, often secured uh, from international cultural organizations and various countries' embassies to advance their own uh, cultural desires and critical practices. Before Ravel and Ravel, this red-haired woman named Chika Kaprava and I had already collaborated on two major curatorial projects. In those, we deliberately cross-pollinated conceptually oriented artists with Georgian textile artisans and developed platforms that involved local art and design students. Unfortunately, art, craft, and academic communities was also aware of as a textile artist or 
myself and the current director of the Smoke Museum. We believe that the schism between these worlds needs to be creatively dismantled. Making Rabble Unravel was also an opportunity to uh, engage Miriam, uh, an ambitious young art historian who had just been appointed the Silk Museum curator. We began by transforming, uh, by brainstorming new strategies for calling attention to the deep textile history of the region and the important contributions that Tbilisi State uh, Silk Museum has made. Founded in 1887, this museum was shaped by the flow of goods and ideas that moved along the great silk route for centuries. <coughs> we decided to cite Ravel and Ravel within a much larger art, uh, international art event that happens annually called Artistarium International. Uh, that invites contemporary artists and curators from around the world to mount exhibitions in Tbilisi. During the lead up to the 10th anniversary of Artistarium, we urged curator Magda Guruli uh, to propose a theme that would catalyze conversations about the interrelationship of, of contemporary art and craft. She enthusiastically responded with this prompt, how do deeper cultural traditions and particularly age-old craft practices have relevance and value for society and for artists working today? Interestingly, the very site of the Artisterium, as you see here, now serving as the Tbilisi History Museum, or Karvasla, is steeped in this Silk Route history. It is a former caravanserai, where nomadic merchants used to arrive, park their camels below, and temporarily set up stalls to sell and trade goods. Given this historical haunt, we proposed a curatorial intervention we stage as a museum within the museum occupying one large hall of Karvasla and converting it into the outpost of the Tbilisi State Silk Museum, which is actually located on the other side of town and is rarely included in any map of the city's cultural attractions. Most locals, let alone international tourists, have never been there. The starting point of Ravel and Ravel was thus the intangible spirit of the Silk Museum, which feels like an extraordinary cap cabinet of curiosities. Functioning as an active and important scientific center for silk research since its founding, the museum boasts an expansive collection of silk industry related objects, as well as an archive and a library. And yet it has struggled to survive in a post-Soviet urban economic environment. After the Rose Revolution, real estate developers even threatened to transform it into a five-star hotel. But Chuka and the staff fought back and continued to work there despite the total lack of heat in the winter and the severely cracking infrastructure of the building. Their protest efforts uh, resulted in the museum becoming officially incorporated into the Georgian National Museum, which secured their existence but gave them very limited resources. Nonetheless, under Chuka's leadership, the Silk Museum has hosted numerous weaving and tapestry workshops, served as a headquarter for an NGO that supports lo local rural craft production, launched an emerging contemporary art writers collective, and invited artists from around the world to be in residence there and create in, uh, interventions within their collections. Uh, honoring its founding motto, preserve and share, Ravel Unravel demonstrated how the Silk Museum continues to catalyze cross-disciplinary visual research on its fiber, exploring the aesthetic implications of new technology and digital pixel structures through jacquard weaving and direct weaving processes. To help underscore the significance of their efforts, I selected research-based artists from the US, Armenia, and Greece, whom uh, you see here, and set their works alongside objects and images borrowed from and produced within the Silk Museum. We began our seven-day trip uh, by doing artist talks at Tbilisi Free, International, uh, Free University, where we also enlisted art students to work with the artists in the show, helping to research, source materials, and install their works. We collaborated also with local NGOs 
and visited rural textile artists in the Kakheti region to better understand their practices. We also made arrangements for 10 representatives from the various craft communities to visit Tbilisi during the artist series. Uh, when they arrived, we also visited the Silk Museum, and for many of them, it was their first time there. And we all participated in a day-long workshop, prompted by telling artistic origin stories. The craftswomen unpacked narratives from within their work, and we collectively brainstormed about new possibilities for expanding their practices. It was very much a two-way exchange between the curators, the artists, and these women. The artists selected for the show had multidisciplinary practices. For example, Jen Bourbon is a research-based visual artist and poet. While doing research for her Silk Poems project, she visited archives, factories, and sericulture uh, laboratories in Asia, Europe, and the Middle East, including <coughs> Tbilisi State Museum one year earlier. But working with scientists at Tufts University's cutting-edge research center, Jen learned about the new technology of liquid silk biosensors inserted into the human body. Um, since silk is one of the only materials that the human body does not reject, the biosensor's embossed surface can receive and transfer a person's biomedical chemical data. Bourbon wondered if the biosensor's surface could be recrafted to contain an image or a text that might be particularly meaningful to an ill patient, rather than the Tufts University logo, which was there. <laughs> she began writing a poem uh, written from the point of view of a silkworm. Pondering its own life cycle, transformation, and mortality, the worm writes to the human whose body would be receiving the biosensor under their skin. She designed a poem strand, and to everyone's delight, the scientists managed to print it at nanoscale onto the liquid silk. The poem's uh, layout mimics the silkworm's back and forth head motion, what you see there on that cocoon, as it spins its cocoon, as well as the uh, silk, uh, silk's six character DNA structure. Um, as illuminated in a video that we included documenting Bourbon's uh, research process and highlighting the Silk Museum's role in it. Her project suggests how new scientific textile technologies, poetics, and a heightened consciousness of the non-human world may actually help restore an individual's well-being. We placed her poem uh, next to the species of moths and laboratory specimens from the um, museum's collection. Um, clearly, to understand our own planet's natural rhythms and life cycles, we must learn to see on a more intimate scale. Prior to the opening, we hosted a poetry translation workshop with the Silk Museum, where staff, poets, and members of the local literary community gathered to learn about Jen's work and to help translate her silk poem into Georgian. Arki Ar um, Adamyan, an Armenian MFA student from Parsons, then went into create into overdrive and created these beautiful hand-stitched Georgian chapbooks that were featured and distributed at the Ravel Unravel show. The Silk Museum also uh, collects the remnants of jacquard loom, considered the earliest form of computer with their punch cards. Uh, they had recently acquired a new jacquard loom, temporarily on loan from Norway, um, so we displayed the outcomes of local artists' experiments and uh, using it and distributed how-to recipes for specific images uh, that they crafted. To be in dialogue with this undertaking, I selected uh, uh, Anthony Aziz and Sammy Kucher's tapestries entitled Some People, shown here arriving from their recent show in Baku. Um, their tapestry really mesmerized local audiences. Aziz and Kucher are a collaborative duo with familial roots in politically opposing Middle Eastern countries, Lebanon and Israel. Their work translates the barrage of violent images emerging from the Arab-Jewish conflict zone, uh, pointing to the explosive and illogical scenes that the global media circulates daily. They turned 
to the jacquard loom to recraft their complex photographic images ma uh, made using Photoshop, a mashup of newspaper shots and staged photos made in collaboration with professional dancers. Produced by ma master weavers in Belgium, some people's woven textures and intricate textile patterns resensitize us to the human dimension of the com uh, conflict. The effect is uncanny, both familiar and unfamiliar at once. Elena Herzog worked closely with students to, to co-create this multimedia installation using damaged traditional rugs as material. Wherever she travels, Alana uh, collects old and new textiles <coughs> gleaned from daily life. Stuff that carries stories, marks time, charts navigations, and conquests. Here are some of the places where they sourced materials, including flea markets and rug shops. Herzog focused on global migrations of technology and uh, uh, culture, um, how people uh, and materials relocate, and how domestic and institutional environments are transformed over time. Uh, Alana and her Georgian students researched not only the history of textile patterns, but also the patterns in the caravansary building itself. And she fixated on the wooden floor where, uh, that, where a former wall once stood before the galleries got their facelifts last year. Um, so you see that in these details. Finally, um, Adonis Bolonakis grew up as a gay man in a Greek family of textile artists. Grandmother was a weaver, mother was a, a wedding dressmaker, and from an early age, he became interested in skills and stories that are fervently passed down within a community of women throughout generations. As an artist in residence on the Cycladic island of Kinos, Boronaki captured the sounds and motions of the local weaving school, uh, uh, his many, their many looms, in um, his motherboard video sound installation. We transported the Silk Museum's traditional loom into the exhibition space, flanked by two inverted wedding dresses and the video playing in the background. During the opening, Bolanakis performed Penelope 2.0 um, with uh, audience participants uh, ripping up the dresses, transforming them into strips to weave. This recalled the um, uh, myth of Penelope, Oedipus's loyal and cunning wife who fended off suitors by weaving and then secretly unraveling her textile nightly so that her work could never be completed and her integrity could remain intact. Many visitors and participants told us that they felt great pleasure in this transgressive act of deconstructing sacred gowns, collectively reconstructing them into a rag rug and ultimately erasing the bride's <coughs> Here they raveled and run, uh, unraveled not only materials, but also gender stereotypes. Um, finally, um, let me just uh, go here, the last bit, um, to the video. with artist Zoe Tapas, and it illuminated the inherent violence of the silkworm's transformation into a butterfly. The artist cuts open a wo woman's wedding gown, which releases her body. Um, in essence, the other objects, works, and themes running through our museum within a museum. In sum, these projects uh, accessed in and through the Tbilisi State Silk Museum instigated how personal stories, new and, and uh, old technologies, and textile histories are intimately intertwined and how it can be taken apart and we have to give them for our own time.
Thank you. Um, I'd like to add my thanks to the organizers and to the working group for the opportunity to be here today. It's really great for me. I've taken part in the classes I'm about to uh, mention. Uh, to thank them for the energy that they put into this experiment and for everything they've taught me along the way. Um, so the title of this paper matches that of a class that I teach at Stanford, in which students both work with their hands in the ceramic studio and meet in a traditional classroom setting to consider how scholarly research can be a creative process. Along the way, guided by a selection of lecture materials and the content of our primary text, we synthetically discuss topics ranging from personal narratives to geochemistry. Here I would like to convey some thoughts about the experience of teaching this course and my concerns for its further development. But first let me say a few words about my personal angle on this pursuit. Ceramics worth investigation from wide-ranging perspectives and can serve as a focus for research and education in our practice, archaeology and archaeometry, mineralogy and anthropology, history, material culture, material science and engineering, critical theory, etc. So ceramics and topics like it can play a vital role in helping us find ways to resuscitate the spirit of liberal education. We can use it as an attractive pretext for courses in which our main aim should be to demonstrate for students how seemingly disparate disciplinary modes can be brought to bear side by side to better understand something of interest in the round in a multi-dimensional way. This conviction largely guides my academic efforts in ceramics related teaching. However, I will also confess to a sort of artistic ulterior motive of wanting to put time and energy into activities that highlight how everything is connected to everything. I also feel a certain urgency to help restore traditional craft and craft practice to a place of greater esteem within the modern university uh, especially with regards to its position vis-a-vis -vis contemporary STEM fields and the fine arts. Applied Physics 100, uh, the questions of play, craft, creativity, and scientific process, meets twice per week uh, for 80 minutes in a typical seminar room and once per week for three hours in a campus ceramic studio. The primary text I assign is six drawing lessons by the artist William Kentridge. This book for me um, is the most insightful extended meditation I've encountered on artistic creative process. And the first time I read it, I couldn't help but note all kinds of similarities with the ways I approach scientific research and the ways that I approach tactical management of a scientific research group. In Applied Physics 100, I assign one chapter of reading per week and devote one classroom meeting to discussing it. The other classroom meetings are used mainly to explore uh, in a manner aimed at applying Kentridge's creative philosophy topics that branch out from the nexus of ceramics into the physics and geochemistry of clay, California geology, a bit of history of the 1849 gold rush, aesthetic philosophy, and ethnographic document, uh, documentaries of traditional pottery practices around the world. I also take the students into our shared nanoscience <coughs> facility to give them an electron microscopy demo and work in a lecture on the use of literary tropes in ceramics criticism and media monology. Meanwhile, in the studio, students spend the first part of the term developing basic skills for working with clay, and then tackle a series of prompts that introduce them to the idea of engaging in creative play under conceptual constraints, ideally to get them to experience the feeling of being surprised by, or sort of discovering, um, an object that they make uh, with their own hands according to their own initiatives. The classroom and studio components of the class are brought together in a term project that each student must complete individually. I ask each student to choose a non-art related topic of interest and spend an hour each week throughout the term researching it, allowing themselves to follow their noses through whatever links catch their interest, even if that leads them to wander far away from their initial topic. Around the middle of the quarter, I ask them each to submit 10 cell phone photos that they're supposed to take during the course of their normal daily routine, capturing forms or textures that catch their interest for whatever reason. The full set of images from the entire class is combined into a folder that all the students can access, and the final project assignment is for each student to make three ceramic objects that combine
combine visual cues from the class and its portfolio with ideas from her individual research activity. My hope is for the students to experience these final products as exceedingly personal forms of creative expression that embody both rational and visceral aspects of their own constellations of interest. Before moving on, I should note that the making part of this class entails ongoing negotiations with the Stanford Student Ceramics Club for the use of their studio space, <laughs> as well as with the uh, product realization laboratory where I built a small gas can we use for firing. This kind of use of borrowed space in an instructional setting uh, is new to me, and while it injects a certain degree of instability in my ability to offer the class on a continuing basis, it also has an interesting effect of adding new stakeholders in my effort to manage programming on campus. To be honest, I would say that this approach in the five seems to work pretty well for a fraction of the students in the class, while others have patience with Lash in hearing and covering such broad ground in a single academic quarter. Uh, I had the impression that the students who developed the greatest um, excitement about ceramics per se early in the quarter, they tend to be the ones who manage to stretch their umbrellas of interest over all the topics we cover and are able to muster the determination required to engage fully with the purposeful vagaries of the final project assignment. In the future, I'd love to find a way to foster this sort of energetic commitment in essentially all of the enrolled students. Um, and so as a next step in the development of this class, I would like to consider some cues from teaching two other uh, courses I've, I've uh, had at Stanford in recent years. The first is uh, teaching students to make ceramic work in a very compressed class format we have called Arts Intensive. Uh, and the other is teaching students about ceramics in the context of an overseas quarter that we spend in Kyoto, Japan. Arts Intensive is a special academic opportunity for which any continuing undergraduate student can apply, uh, in which the students take a single arts-focused course within a span of 18 days at the end of the summer quarter. For students enrolled in unit-heavy majors, such as pre-meds and some engineering concentrations, this can be an expedient way for them to cover a graduation requirement we have in creative expression. In the Ceramics Arts Intensive course at COTOP, we have the students working pretty much all day every day for the entire period. And I think it's fair to say that the singularity of purpose and the communal studio energy that this engendered brought out a remarkable level of commitment and enthusiasm from nearly all of the students. So I think this is my first clue toward helping students to more readily tolerate radical curricular indiscipline. Uh, my second clue comes from the experience of teaching a 10-week course on ceramic art and technology from ancient to modern for Stanford students visiting our overseas program in Kyoto which took advantage of the location by incorporating a number of field trips. The material <coughs> for this course was again fairly wide-ranging, covering aspects of Japanese aesthetics, ceramic connoisseurship, Japanese medieval history, Japanese approaches to and attitudes towards craft, and Japanese technology and industry. The key takeaway for me was seeing how students' excitement about experiencing special people, places, and things related to ceramics in Kyoto and, and, and thereabouts uh, helped them to hang on with a rather bumpy shoulder. So before concluding with a sketch of where I hope to take all this in further developing the uh, Applied Physics 100 idea, um, I should briefly describe a small ceramic symposium I organized last year at Stanford focused on the art and science of iron bearing surfaces. The symposium was a valuable exercise in forming interdisciplinary community as the set of nine invited speakers included potters, material scientists, a sculptor, and a historian. The formal public presentations were confined to a single day, but we spent several additional days together visiting laboratories and museums, and talking about lots of things related to ceramics and materiality. By the end of the gathering, we were convinced that we needed to reconvene in the future, and various project ideas spun off from our conversation. Among these was, a, was an idea to curate a small set of exhibitions around, uh, about the art and science of iron-bearing ceramic surfaces to be installed in both conventional and informal gallery spaces around Stanford campus. So far, we have one in the Stanford Archaeology Center lobby and one in the main corridor of an instrument suite in the Stanford Nano Shared Facilities. These bring together contemporary work from potters who attended the symposium with artifacts from the collections of the Archaeology Center and the Cantor Arts Center, as well as optical and electron microscope images of ceramic surfaces. We also just installed a larger exhibit of contemporary Japanese and North American ceramic work um, in the East Asia Library <coughs> at Stanford, which includes pieces on loan from ceramic artists in private collections as well as work by students and other members of the Stanford community. 
This set of ceramics related exhibitions has been supported and facilitated by a diverse set of administrative units across campus, uh, which I now like to think of as additional new stakeholders in my Stanford uh, Ceramics Coalition, and is helping to raise the visibility of the interdisciplinary study of ceramics among student faculty and staff. But the most ambitious project that spun off from our symposium last year centers on the imaginative phrase Mediterranean porcelain and brings me back to the topic of interdisciplinary teaching. I just returned a few days ago from a preliminary scouting expedition in Cyclades with a small team, including a material scientist slash archaeologist, a historian of science and technology, a historian of science of Chinese, uh, sorry, a historian of Chinese art, and two potters, one of whom specializes in geology and the production of clay and glaze and steam molten materials. During the trip, we visited museums and archaeological sites to take in the visuals of Bronze Age Typhonic art, and also prospected for local porcelain and clay components and Chinese-style glaze minerals. The teaching aspect of this project is to develop a course that would take a group of perhaps a dozen Stanford students to Greece for about two weeks at the end of the summer quarter for an introduction to studio ceramics and to visit historical and geological sites there. These same students would then continue in an autumn quarter interdisciplinary ceramic seminar back on home campus. So my hope is to harness the arts intensive life format and the overseas experience of the course of this course prelude in the cyclades to foster student enthusiasm, engagement, and commitment to help carry them through the wild side of my transdisciplinary syllabus in the autumn quarter. We're aiming to possibly start such a course in the 2020-21 academic year. While next year in 2019, uh, we'll need to make a couple of return visits to our base in the Cyclades to build a suitable kiln there and conduct a preliminary Mediterranean porcelain making event with a small selection of potters and scholars. So since this is a work in progress, I don't think I need to offer any conclusions. Uh, but <laughs> if any of you have suggestions or feedback about uh, all this, please do let me know. And thank you very much for your attention. Shared ground goes beyond just sort of one person um, overseeing some of this stuff. We rely increasingly on collaborations, um, and it's generosity that actually fuels so much of this. And um, I feel like this conference from the organizers, the organizing committee, the institutions, shares um, in generous kind of spirit. In a time when 3D printing and digital images dominate, and even industrial production seems foreign and distant, um, there is increasing interest in how things are made. This can be seen in the growing popularity of DIY videos, workshops offered um, in summer uh, craft uh, schools and during the year, all of which are focused in on pre-industrial craftsmanship. But the need for a low-tech maker shop is fueled by more than just simple nostalgia for a lost world. Getting a feel for workmanship and understanding fabrication at the level of material ineffability, the, its ability to fight back um, in spite of your intention, um, or even the, the choices of fabrication techniques um, the, from a wide range of possibilities that are often available at any moment in time. These shed light on objects from the past and stimulate different and new analytic and interpretive pathways. Rather than relying on formal or stylistic analysis of objects, scholars can ask questions about materials, reveal the embodied knowledge of pre-industrial makers, understand the relationship between tool and aesthetics, and question long-standing assumptions about innovation, emulation, appropriation. Exploratory making, a sort of experimental archaeology or reverse engineering has a distinguished lineage within academic teaching environments. It was a key pedagogical principle of John Dewey, the progressive who stressed learning by doing, as well as Joseph Albers, the prince, uh, who was influential instructor of design at Black Mountain College and then at Yale in the post-war era. Hands-on instruction also coheres with recent methodological proposals from scholars like Tim Ingold, whose book Making sees craftsmanship as the common link between the disciplines of anthropology, archaeology, art history, and design, as well as Pamela Smith, who has created a laboratory here at Columbia University dedicated 
to the practical recreation of Renaissance techniques and an exploration of natural philosophy. For all of these figures, making exercises have been key to the investigation of the past. Making is inextricably linked to knowing and to scholarship. Each informs the other. One cannot exist in some ways without the other. And just sort of making that um, obvious in terms of the title for my presentation, that if you know making, you can also make meaning um, and how these are interconnected sorts of endeavors. The goal of some of this pedagogy has never been to train craftspeople, but rather to help students and scholars learn to ask the right questions of paper archives, of objects, and of people. No matter what your resource material is, knowing something about material from the inside out is important. Over the past few years, I've organized several discrete making sorts of activities. Um, these have had a positive impact um, in a kind of loose way, but a dedicated space, associated equipment, and a funding line that is now underway permits a greater and sustained benefit. For a freshman seminar I taught several years ago, uh, Furniture in American Life, I worked with Peter Follinsby, the former joiner of Plymouth Plantation, to teach students how to ride, plane, and join, and carve oak in a 17th century New England, just as a 17th century New England joiner would have. In the fall of 2015, I hosted a coppersmith from Pune, India, uh, and a scholar, Indian scholar who teaches design at Arizona State to lead a workshop on working with copper. The artisan brought his own tools, talked about his work with slides and video, and then taught graduate students and museum professionals how to planish and chase copper using those tools. For these workshops, I often had to cobble together spaces and materials. For Peter Hollinsby, we met in the old shop at the Furniture Study, the basement storage area of the Yale Art Gallery's furniture collection. But that space was small, was not well equipped with appropriate set of tools for that task. It lacks basic tools like a pro. Many of the edge tools which had been collected um, um, they've co been collected primarily for their aesthetic merit more than for their actual function. Therefore, I had to ask Peter to bring tools with him and to work with him in that capacity. For the coppersmith, the only space I could find on campus was at the Center for Engineering and Innovative Design, um, part of the engineering school in which it's primarily 3D printers and um, sort of three uh, different kinds of computer-based activity and mainly for people just to explore um, different things and we ended up hammering on the carpeted meeting area in that particular space um, in a university you try to use any space you can um, we depended upon the presenters to bring all their tools and materials with them i attempted to build bridges with shops in the school of architecture the school of arts but again, the shops and instructors there are dedicated to a different sort of endeavor, that of problem solving and creation. It proved difficult to convince them to allocate space and equipment, even temporarily, to, for demonstration and exploration. The instructors rightly prioritized their own demanding students' needs in allocating space. There are even some workshops that are sprinkled throughout the residential dorms at Yale, um, one for, several for pottery, one for weaving, one for woodworking, but it's difficult to interrupt existing student activities, which are primarily extracurricular and things that could take five hours or spread out over two weeks because of the sporadic nature of their attention. Um, looms are set up, furniture projects underway. It became difficult to try to interrupt those sorts of uh, projects and to use those spaces um, or to even draw on the part-time technicians that will receive the shops and are paid by those particular dorms. So the purpose is very different uh, within that kind of um, extracurricular, non-pedagogical uh, kind of use. Thinking through uh, the curriculum and the collections at Yale, I thought it appropriate to establish a new low technology shop, concentrated essentially on four different media that are supported in the Art Gallery's collection and the Peabody Museum's collection, woodworking, metalworking, weaving, and uh, ceramics. Rather than use powered equipment and resource-intensive techniques like bronze casting uh, and emphasize finished products only, 
we focus upon hand skills and discrete what I might call Floyd-like exercises. That is, they are small, investigative uh, kinds of exercises. Biomechanic feedback is more valued than the polished look of the final product. Flexibility and then creative and intensive use of tools, rather than specialized tools and jigs for every little purpose, is a guiding principle. This establishment of a dedicated low technology shop is now taking place out on West Campus, a whole sort of interdisciplinary part of Yale's campus um, that is basically 15 minutes to the west of Central Campus, in which you've got collection storage, research, uh, science, uh, conservation studios, um, and now this low technology shop. It seems to be the opportunity to have correct tools and materials right readily at hand to align the equipment to the academic goal of understanding historic techniques and provide a complement to the study storage areas, the conservation studios, and the research labs just down the hall. What we've got now is space, and we're starting to build um, the particular program. But we've done what we've done in the meantime is explore different ways in which we might be able to activate this space. Back in May of 2017, we undertook a series of spoon making exercises as part of a material culture teach-in um, to develop a sense of metallurgy. I borrowed from my experiences with the Puna coppersmithing, the Tombach tradition. We provided spoon blanks, um, in which I just had sheet copper um, stacked up um, and cut out um, to at least get the, uh, the blank set up. Um, we instructed participants how working on the ground, which I thought was important to also understand the body um, as a tool to use feet uh, for different parts of the process rather than just standing at a bench, um, so that there was a sense of working on the ground to use a wooden swage, say, to establish the bowl, something I just whacked out um, that morning, um, and then how to further shape uh, the spoon with a stake and raising hammer, um, and watching people understand that actually metal sometimes, depending on how you're hitting it, you can start to curve it. You can, um, you know, a spoon that actually, if you don't hammer consistently, it takes on a totally asymmetrical kind of uh, appearance. So. Shaping becomes this important kind of way in which all of a sudden you start to realize I've got to be even in my hammer, I've got to uh, hammer on both sides in some respect rather than having it look like a left-handed hockey stick um, along the way. Um, you know, really instructive uh, sorts of steps um, in realizing actually all the hammering stiffens what had been a very flimsy um, sort of material. And then learning how to decorate it, chasing it um, with small uh, chasing tools. Um, our spoon makers learned a great deal about the way metal moves, the way it stiffens, the way it takes on different kinds of shapes. Last May, we uh, debuted our maker space with a series of exercises around fiber, taught by Andrew Hamilton, uh, a PhD uh, from Harvard, who's done a great deal of work on uh, Andean weaving. We introduced a number of different fibers, wool, cotton, linen, camelids uh, from South America, had uh, participants try spinning <laughs> fibers with a variety of different techniques from drop spindles to wheels to charkas, the South Asian uh, tradition of uh, spinning, and people realizing the difficulty in just thinking you know, thread, something very simple that we tend to buy commercially, what different fibers did in terms of how you had to be consistent in terms of even using something like a drop spindle. So when you start to see um, the people uh, in, in the highlands of Peru just walking around spinning with drop spindles, you have a much greater appreciation for the fineness and why you're able to get high thread counts on, uh, on Indian textiles. There's so much of that tacit knowledge um, that's uh, involved there. We also um, just allow students to, to play with a tiny loom as well, just to understand what happens with uh, those threads and how putting them together just thinking about it in a totally different way rather than just weaving as something with a little uh, simple hand loom, all of a sudden going from spinning and the development of your thread into uh, this kind of activity. This October, I'm teaching a graduate seminar on material literacy that's starting to put um, some of these ideas into practice um, within a course. And it's a course that's attracted uh, people from 
history of art from anthropology, from history of science and medicine, um, as well as people from the School of Art and Architecture. It's a small group of 12 people in which it's reading and it's making, it's investigating um, different parts. And we've, we've already, sort of in thinking about metal, um, talked to one of the research scientists in terms of talking about the development from understanding copper alloys from color, striking, um, different kinds of techniques uh, that were used in the past to different kinds of sampling from x-ray as well as microanalysis that has been very fundamental to sort of go from um, a, a simple sort of uh, almost um, multi-sensoral approach to the micro approach to understand principles. Um, we're also going to be um, learning about wood um, by making um, spoons from green wood um, using only the most basic uh, tools of using a throw, a hatchet, a hook knife, and a straight knife. So students immediately sort of working on um, different kinds of, um, of wood, uh, whether it be sort of a trunk, uh, stump, whether it be a bench, how you start using a throw to simply wipe out uh, the stock um, and then go to using a hatchet to make it uh, as quickly as you can. In other words, you're using rough workmanship um, to quickly get down to something that you then can go back to um, and do the, the next work. It's not like you start with a simple little straight knife with a huge log, um, just the same way you wouldn't start with sandpaper that would be 600 grit um, as, as a finishing thing, but you actually sort of work through a sequence of tools. So here's you know just taking half a log, take the uh, pit off, you start whacking away, um, creating niches. Um, some people cheat and use a saw. Um, <laughs> they want to sort of, uh, get at the risk of hitting themselves um, with the uh, edge. But then once you're done, um, you end up sort of, this is a very simple, this is probably, um, for me, the first time doing this, that's probably 30 minutes work um, just with a hatchet. And I, Peter Ballinger can do this in about five minutes, just like you quickly get rid of what you don't need. Um, and then what you can do is come back in with a straight knife um, or a hook knife, which is curved and allows you to scoop out the inside of a bowl um, with the result of a finished spoon. So again, this is something that you can do pretty quickly. Somebody who's a good spoon carver can make one of these in 10 minutes. Um, and so you start to appreciate um, this way in which you get a, a, a really good sense of the uh, properties of the material. Greenwood is so much easier. It's like um, if you try to carve this with uh, kiln dried wood, um, you'll dull your tools in no time. Um, there's no efficiency to it. There's a value um, found playing, uh, working with wood with moisture, the principles of working quickly with the appropriate tool to get rid of the waste um, so you can then devote careful time with a finesse tool for the finish. We also um, had just finished on Wednesday um, a class that we um, introduced them to clay. Um, and again, the goal was not necessarily to teach them how to throw on a wheel, but actually how to think about clay as a material. So um, it's a two-hour class, and we started off um, initially just giving them the four, four different kind of body types, earthenware, stoneware, porcelain, and kind of a sculpting clay with, uh, with a lot of grit to it, um, and just had students play with it and try coiling, try pinch potting, try um, sort of forming something maybe just with a, a, a little block of wood. We gave them no tools. All they had was you know, a lump uh, of clay in front of them. And just watching them sort of develop and start to realize that the sculpting clay was really dense, was not going to be able to get very thin. What porcelain felt like in terms of being able to get it thin with a lot, without a lot of the kind of manipulation uh, of pinching to try to get, get the coiling smoothed out. Um, so then once they were feeling pretty good, then we destabilized them. Um, and we introduced raw materials like ball clay, kaolin, silica, sand, um, feldspar, and gave them certain formulas that they were supposed to produce without scale. Um, what we did was we had wooden template with a, a two inch uh, hole drilled out of it, and one with uh, one inch that basically broke down to like 25% and 10%. And had them with these formulas, they had to go get the materials and sort of push it into uh, those circular cutouts as a way of measuring. Um, and if you had a 10 um, sort of a circle, if you needed a five, you cut that in half. So you know, get them to be.
creative and innovative in terms of limited kinds of tools. Um, and gave them sort of a set formula to see if they could push the limits. And you know, the, the discovery they had using feldspar or silica um, was striking. Um, and you know, they were completely sort of, um, sort of mystified uh, how these materials started to mix. And then we turned them loose and said, OK, now create your own formula. Um, and see, you know, based on some of these properties that you've understood, can you mix your own formula? And watching what they did, they all did test strips. And they all did um, objects that we we're now going to go fire, bring them into class, and then they're able to see the results of shrinkage, um, what what explodes, um, so where did they push the boundaries? And some of the formulas we provided were going to be formulas that were literally on the edge. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, so the whole notion about thinking about ceramics um, through that kind of interactive way, this is just um, something that I'm working with Mark Potter, um, uh, Potter in New Haven, um, who loves doing this sort of stuff. And so this was some of the things that he was doing just with um, different kinds of clay bodies uh, with a pinch pot um, kind of a vessel. We continue to purchase um, tools uh, to develop specific uh, funds for this kind of programming, because it's really essential to be able to bring in people like um, Peter Follinsby, like Mark Potter, like Andrew Hamilton to run these kinds of workshops um, and sort of are now thinking about ways in which we might be running this annual teach-in um, that engages with materials and processes um, for faculty and graduate students in museum uh, professionals on campus, <coughs> running an object lab uh, for Yale undergraduate students during certain times of the academic year, thinking a lot about today's uh, notion about that intensive. Um, give them uh, something when they're not actually in the semester of coursework, but actually so they can really devote that kind of uh, concentrated time. But we also envision that the shop will continue to be a resource for conservators in the building who want to try um, different ideas out, um, as well as curators of the collection uh, in the study center. And therefore, this kind of programming, uh, we hope, will ultimately raise the material, what I call material literacy, of undergraduates, graduate students, faculty, and museum staff, and furthermore, the kind of timeless uh, equipment, the flexibility, that kind of intensive and creative use of limited kinds of tools will allow for future unanticipated uh, curricular uses, not only by someone like me, but also people in the history of science, um, people in engineering, and other STEM disciplines. These are the sort of people who are actually being attracted uh, to these kinds of courses. Thanks so much. I'm going to start off with uh, a crucial acknowledgement from my side, uh, and this is to say this is Anna Mai Ori. Uh, she is director of Rudy Duarte Museum in Karashok, and she and her institution are co-author of much of the material I am bringing to this panel session today. So I want to do two things in this presentation. The first thing I want to do is share with you a case study titled Sami Dagi Museum or Sami Art Museum. This is an ongoing open source experiment in radical museology that is, as I just acknowledged, co produced by Nordnorsk Kunstmuseum, and that's the museum where I have been working as director now for about two and a half years, and the Redu Duarte Museum. And the second thing I want to do then is to interject into this symposium a term that we have coined through this work, museum performance. And that's not, uh, there's somebody that picked up on like a hashtag Twitter thing. Oh, great that somebody else is doing a dance performance in museums as museum performance. That's not what this museum performance is. So, so this, uh, this term museum performance as a means for perhaps expanding the ways in which we might currently think about craft and museums, their relationships and the roles these things play in conveying and shaping ideas about one another and, of course, the world around us. 
but I think it may be important to get our, our bearings first, or get, get to place us on the map first, uh, as this story is set within a specific geography and context that I don't assume all of you could place correctly on the map. So, uh, so we are somewhere over here, like way off screen, and this is the relative, this is the re le relative latitude for all of you that get schooled in school about that Columbus like sailed right directly west. It's, uh, we're, we're quite south uh, in relationship to uh, a European reality here. So and we're over here somewhere to the left, whereas I generally spend uh, my time, my daily life there, um, which is in Tromso in the north of Norway. And that, in the grand scheme of things, is relatively close to our great colleague in Kalashok in uh, in there. Uh, so we are thus situated in what is the high north of something that still today we can call Europe. Uh, that's increasing up for grabs. But this is, <laughs> in any case, a multicultural transnational Arctic space that spans across the current nation states of Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Russia. And this is also an otherwise Sotme. Oops, that was the wrong way. Sotme, uh, which is home of the indigenous Sami people. So this is a colonial space a colonial space which is wrapped and clouded in problematic, unresolved narratives of both Scandinavian benevolence and Nordic exceptionalism. So uh, we always fight between who's the happiest country in the world. That's not always the case for everybody. That's just to be, to be said. Uh, so in any case, that, that's the area that we're working in. So let me jump into this case study. In February 2017, Nordors Kunstmuseum a state-funded and state-founded institution established in the mid-1980s with a mandate to work with Norwegian art and craft ceased to exist. In its place, an alternative institution emerged, a possible version of the as yet unrealized Sami Daidemuseum that has long been the desire of the Sami artistic community, museum sector, and society at large. Across the next few months, this fictive indigenous arts institution performed a possible version of itself, inscribing and precipitating a form of virtual reality that raised timely questions about the general absence of Sami arts within the art history, lack of understanding, limited ethnographic framing of Sami culture within the arts, museum sector, and society more broadly. So this was a performative shift and a shift that was achieved through alterations to Nordos Kunstmuseum's interior and facade, a sort of total makeover, including the display of an entirely different collection of art, the use of Sami language for both exhibition texts and general signage, a revamped museum shop, the creation of an independent graphic identity, and accompanying communication platform, such as this, a rogue website, a rogue Facebook account, and the production <coughs> of a range of related museum ephemera and merchandise. So we had buttons, we had postcards, we had posters, business cards, stickers, we had t-shirts, <laughs> and still have t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> and the result then was a speculative space, a space complete with a performance artist as director that pointed towards an alternative reality, one that links to a different past existed in a parallel present and seeks on another, still attainable, I hope, future. And in this alternative reality, Sami Daidi Musea opened its doors on the 15th of February, 2017, with the inaugural exhibition, There Is No, and then proceeded to disappear again just two months later, on the 16th of April last year. During that time, where did it? That was my phone. <laughs> That's the Norwegian Siri. <laughs> so during during this time, uh, Sami Daidi Museum offered a full range of outreach and programming activities to its public, from tours and seminars to workshops for families and children, and concerts, while knowingly precipitating and reproducing itself through social media channels used by locals and international visitors alike. I think I'll use Catch or one of them. This all happened overnight and without prior warning. 
with the first announcement of Salmi Daidimi there, the existence to both the press and general public coming from Salmi Daidimi there itself on institutional letterhead and digital platforms. The other half of the time aspect of this project is equally important, with Salmi Daidimi there being conceived and realized in a period of roughly two to three months from initial concept through final implementation. So as a museum performance, Salmi Daidi Museum aims to open up and drive debate around existing understandings of what museums are, what they do, and how they behave, both within the specific Salmi Nordic context and, of course, beyond. In so doing, Salmi Daidi Museum maps out intentionally disruptive strategies of co-authorship, temporality, tactical anonymity, and rapid institutional change that sought to decolonize and indigenize a dominant museum space, my museum space, and its accompanying mainstream narratives from within. So this is, in general, about claiming, or indeed reclaiming the museum as a public space for dialogue and co-creation, driven by a shared, dispersed, generative, and hands-on conceptualization of ownership. Sami Daidi Museum challenges second guesses and attempts to rewrite our understandings sometimes too limited understandings of things like authorship, expertise, authority, heritage, and yes, the usefulness or not of categories like art and craft and their attendant connotations and legacies. So in the case of Nordnorsk Kunstmuseum, which was replaced then by Salmi Daidi Museum, there was a pressing need to connect to and work together with and for Salmi communities and to indigenize and multiculturalize our museum space and institutional identity. So this involved establishing trust, credibility, and common ground, an underlying approach that communicates, I hope, a wider mission of and commitment to inclusion, signaling the desire for a museum space that welcomes and indeed embraces other voices and a multiplicity of points of view. There is a further aspect to the Salmi Daidi Museum project that is perhaps of particular relevance to the overarching cracked context of this symposium, um, and that is the Sami concept and practice of Duoci. While often translated too simplistically as handiwork or traditional craft, Duoci is better understood as a complex of living heritage, caste and material knowledge, socio-cultural belief systems, and invention, of course, amongst other things. That categorically resists and provokes standard Western art historical reference points, such as art craft, traditional modern, and heritage innovation. It was decisive that the approach to display and curation within the performative institutional framework proposed by Salmi Dadi Museum should similarly challenge, provoke, and perhaps even overturn the deeply entrenched art craft divide, still driving a lot of work and thinking in the museum sector internationally today. This was achieved through an intentional blurring of boundaries and an absolute sharing of ground both conceptually and spatially, that itself interrogated and critiqued received understandings of art and craft and the relative usefulness of such distinctions. So this ongoing work, because it's still ongoing, version 2.0, 3.0, coming soon to museums near you, hopefully. So, so this ongoing work has, has, of course, generates reflection over time. And it has led me to think increasingly about whether we might have got one thing a bit wrong here in the naming of the fictive museum in its first iteration, at least. Salmi Daidi Museum versus Salmi Duoji Museum. Although there are clear reasons for the choice of name linked to a history of artist-led activism dating back from the late 1970s and forward. Uh, but the There Is No Exhibition title uh, on the banner here, particularly when coupled with the fictive institutional name, results in the most concise of statements. There is no Salmi Daidi Museum. Uh, this sentence responds on the one hand to the immediate political need to communicate clearly and precisely about what is a very real problem and imbalance in the Nordic museum landscape today. At the same time, the there is no exhibition title drives at more complex, deeply ingrained, and ultimately, I think, more problematic aspects of contemporary cultural politics that reach well beyond the Nordic sphere. There is no has to do with definitions and who wields and does not wield power in various processes of defining. How and what we teach, how and what we learn, our personal roles,
roles are institutional roles and how we use them or not. There is no intentionally references and plays upon colonial dynamics that make claims about certain cultures, peoples, or individuals, including, in this instance, of course, the Sangha, as lacking a word for art, and thus, by extension, allegedly lacking an understanding for and or practices of art more broadly. So as an experiment, I'm going to wrap this up. As an experiment in indigenizing and decolonizing the museum, Sangha Dai Museum aims to deliver concrete strategies and actual measures for rapid change that might hopefully, and I hope this might prove the case for some of you, that it might prove transferable to other institutional settings, cultural frameworks, and political contexts. There are certainly issues of craft in terms of the material and content, as well as crafting in terms of approach and making at play here. The main takeaway with Sami Daidi Museum, however, is, I think, the message that we can and must challenge long-standing imbalances in the communities we serve through a radical and productive rethinking of the museum or the university or whatever your space might be. And of course, then the categories and definitions that museums, universities, your spaces, inscribe, uphold, and propagate. Museums of art, museums of craft, museums of ethnography, museums of science, and so on. There are a vast number of alternative museums we need and need to demand to be realized that have not yet been allowed to exist. The museum performance is one way of actually responding to this condition with the means you have at your disposal. The speculative proposition it in turn points to is a new conceptualization of the museum as an arena for action that exists as, when, and where it is most needed. Thank you. shows how we can actually do that on the ground and teach other people how to do that. Um, and I just wanted to start with a really quick question before I open it up, and that is, these are really brave things to do, these sort of changing up and disrupting institutions um, with ideas of craft. And I assume that you've all gotten some pushback, um, and, and you've, you've touched on a little bit of it. But I wanted to ask to talk a little bit more about some of the pushback that you've gotten and, um, and, and any advice you have on how we can all sort of do what you asked us to do, which is bring this into our own institutions and our own spaces. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll respond to that in a bit of a different way because I think um, Kraft actually has afforded a way to go about this at Stanford that avoids pushback. And the main thing being that uh, ceramics is a topic that nobody at the university thinks they own. So you can kind of, I mean, I've done all of this completely outside the departmental structure at the university. Um, so I don't have to convince any colleagues that this is a good idea because nobody really cares what I'm doing in terms of teaching ceramics. Uh, at the same time, you know, the administration has been very interested in finding ways of engaging non-art major students in making art. And so it's enough, and ceramically, it counts as making. And so it's been a thing that the administration has been interested in supporting, at least in a, a sort of a trial phase. So that sort of uh, slightly outsider situation of craft has been very has been very helpful, actually. I'd say in at least a little bit of stuff that I've been doing so far. As far as 
with the uh, the pushback, I, I mean, interestingly, from from there really was no pushback from anyone in the in the Silk Museum. I mean, that museum was completely open and um, really eager to experiment and try things out. Uh, there was more pushback in the Tbilisi History Museum, which has practices that are more, you know, kind of a conventionally art, uh, contemporary art oriented, or um, sometimes a little bit more stuck in the Soviet patterns of like, you can't put a hole in the wall, you have to hang it from a string, you know, things that are, <laughs> are more time honored tradition, but um, have, are slow to change. So um, those those were the kinds of tensions uh, that came out. But I also think um, one thing that's interesting in terms of pushback uh, or at least having to reshape is when you um, try to do these things on minuscule budgets. I, I literally had six and a half thousand dollars, which included the travel and the materials and everything to do the show. Um, so we had to do a little extra fundraising, but. That came um, from the only um, US-based cultural organization, namely the US Embassy, which um, had just come under Trump's rule, and we really didn't know if we'd get a penny. Uh, it's gotten a lot harder now to get anything um, that isn't oriented to business interests in the city. So what was um, uh, key is I, I pushed for something that was um, going to involve people, involve uh, rural um, uh, textile artists, et cetera. And they said, well, the only way we'll let you do that or we'll give you the money is if you um, help them improve their business strategies. So, you know, there's ways in which with pushback like that, you have to get really creative about how to frame this in a way that um, says the right words to the funding sources and yet doesn't compromise what you believe you're there to do. So, uh, you know, that, that origin story and people telling things about what they, how they make and what they make and how they present their work, you know, was a way to sort of satisfy the business end of it, but really was not limiting to, you know, to doing something which I don't feel like I have any expertise in. Um, and I really wouldn't, you know, it's not my, my interest, so. I think like Hideo that I have a, yeah, you know, there's a group of people who get it, um, who are interested in w working across uh, boundaries of disciplines, um, even to the fact that the head of West Campus, who's a chemist, um, actually is an amateur wood turner, so he got it right away about we could have this space and actually pay for the budget um, to renovate what had been an old hooded uh, lab space when Bayer had, uh, had owned the campus before. But I'd say that the place where the pushback is not so much on people, it's on uh, bureaucracy, and it's the um, it's the shop safety people at Yale who are most concerned um, about what I'm doing. And I had to, I had to go uh, in front of them. And it, it's not, yeah, there was somebody killed in one of the labs uh, in 2011. Um, somebody who was working late at night uh, at the end of the semester on a metal lathe. Um, fairly much unsupervised. Um, and so that it forced everybody to become much more uh, concerned about what's going on within these kinds of these spaces uh, throughout campus. And so I had to go in front of the um, this committee and you know initially everybody's all worried, you know, in terms of you gotta have this, gotta have that, gotta have this. And I, then I started explaining sort of what would be going on in terms of, and this is why I wanna make it sort of hand tools, low tech, um, and I said, even you know, having something like a treadle lathe or a pole lathe, you know, we're going to be turning green wood. Um, I would have a mask on anyway. You don't need a shield. You don't need to be worried about RPMs and things really spinning out of control. Um, this is fairly uh, easy. But you could see as I talked to them about what it was that I was doing, they had a total misunderstanding of what one would do in the shop or a total misunderstanding of the fact that I knew what I was talking about, about the materials and the tools. Um, they thought I was just sort of this pie in the sky. I don't know whether you found the same thing. But, you know, so you try to find these spaces where you're educating bureaucracy forward uh, and getting the kind of uh, audience that you want to participate. Yeah, 
have you the here to talk to Please. and flip, flip the question uh, back around. I, I guess my uh, my I, I would say that the, the, this idea of pushback to things like at least what we were doing is actually it sort of mi misses the point because there's actually a huge social pushback that's lurking there and has been there for decades. So really what we get and what you know like with the Fred Wilson finding the museum, when you do it, there's just there's been people pushing at the door for decades, yeah? And you do it and then the flood today flies in. So the the, the pushback is actually to acknowledge the pushback that's existing there. Perfect existence. Yeah. <laughs> and not to be worried about but to actually embrace it. And then and then the people that are pushing back, well then you you know who's on which side. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you so much for these presentations. Really inspiring, especially as a as a teacher. And uh, I wanted to kind of, I guess, take inspiration from the last provocation and think. Uh, so, with the exception of Olivia Matthews' project, these are elite institutions. How do you think about this within, you know, a, 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 any colleagues out that kind of funding status that you have? So you already told us. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I think you, you are the institution you are. Uh, so for, for our project, one of the key things there is it's precisely recognizing that privilege and, and using it. Uh, so in a sense, I can't really a, a, answer your question because that's, uh, what, that's not my reality. So my, I mean, but I was hugely aware from day one in the job that I'm taking over an institution that has frameworks, and I get really tired of people in the museum, oh yeah, but it takes so long, or we can't do these things. Well, why not? You've got your budget, you have your staff, you have your resources, you have your spaces, so what's stopping you, right? <laughs> what I refer to as the eorization so, uh, of uh, museums. <laughs> so it's like, it's like I, I can't give advice, how can, how can a low, like, non-budget sort of thing do it? It's the responsibility of the privileged institution to collaborate and work with other people. That's, you know, so, uh, I could talk about that if I was on the other end, but I'm not. So uh, but I think that's the point, though. If I could follow on that, I, I think that, it, at least in terms of the way I think about what we're doing at Stanford, it's not, I mean, the specific activities are nice, um, and it's great to be working with the, the few students, but uh, in uh, higher education in general, like, I actually think the most important thing about all of this is that I'm a scientist who gets up in front of a room with kids and tells them about how much I love working with clay. And to sort of give them the permission that in their education, they can also make time and space to do that kind of thing. Uh, so, you know, hopefully, if you can kind of set those examples, that um, it's good that that comes from, from the top in, in a sense, um, especially in, you know, with respect to changing the culture in STEM fields from a place like Stanford and Silicon Valley and seeing how that's been done. And I think just, yeah, I mean, you recognize that, but at the same time, I'm not investing great sums of money in lab equipment. Um, that what I'm doing is just incremental. It's adding on slowly but surely, and it's actually, there's small sorts of things that some of which I'm buying myself um, and just contributing into uh, this particular shop. So it's not necessary. I have this incredible funding line. I have to scrape uh, for anything I can. Um, it doesn't, there's not an automatic line that's saying, oh, okay, Ned, whatever you want to do, go. Um, you know, I, I just want to add one other thing, and that is, um, even though I described to you the reality of the funding for this project, I think it's also important to kind of return to the point that you brought up about shared ground and sharing economies, because um, the artists that I chose, knowing what my budget was, I also knew had the privilege of different institutional affiliations. So Anthony Aziz and I used our faculty research money to pay for our tickets over there. So then Parsons would get credited uh, as one of the funding sources. Um, uh, Lana had just had the privilege of getting a Guggenheim Fellowship. So she was less concerned about you know making her, you know, getting the ticket. Uh, and we also applied for last minute emergency funds for Jen to get funded. So there are ways in which all of us as in, uh, you know, professionals, I think, can creatively think about how to tap our own institutions 
to then bring back that information and those experiences to uh, the places we come from and help that dialogue uh, continue. Thank you. Hi. Thank you so very much. I think everything you're each doing is so very important in each of your spaces. I'm here from the Institute for Therapeutic Craft and Creativity, and one of the things that we're doing is trying to work with doctors and hospitals and clinicians and patients and whatnot. Um, we started from the premise that almost across the board, anybody who, who works with their hands has this one sentiment, which is, it makes me feel really good. Despite all of the other things going on, they eventually conclude, wow, that really made me feel good. So starting from that point, the premise for us was, if we know that, then maybe we can engage the use of craft to assist people in understanding how to deliberately use craft to engage in feeling better, to change their, their process knowledge, you get process knowledge when you work with your hands and so forth. So we came back from George Washington University where they, they were open to it. We've been, we were invited to the American Psychiatric Association to talk to their doctors. And we're finding that there is pushback from these other, other industries to invite other people in. The opioid crisis is existing. They're looking, they're seeking different options for them. So I just want to say that I hope and pray that we're in a place where, and I'm seeing, I'm just excited, I'm seeing more of a place for this kind of use of craft in these in these other places. Just want to let you know. Anybody aware of Herbert Hall, in terms of an early 20th century uh, craft therapy? Um, he was somebody who wrote and one of the pioneers in terms of um, therapy through making things and actually was one of the people behind Marblehead Pottery uh, from the arts and crafts movement. So there's a there is a long tradition of therapy um, and the ways in which um, psychology and craft are inextricably connected in modern America. I hope that the time has come where it's coming back over the next century. Thank you so much. Although at one point I know that they were, Andy and Harmon, the silver manufacturer, were sponsoring um, metalworking exercises for um, people coming back with battle shock from World War II. Um, and so I kept thinking, so what is hammering the sound of metal doing for that? But that's another story. <laughs> We've got a question back here. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for your wonderful presentations, all of you. Um, my question has to do with collaboration and widespread modeling and change. So obviously all of the projects that you presented were wider collaborations with institutions in the scope of that particular project. But I guess my question is more about the possibility for intra-institutional collaborations to really change. And the example I have in mind is there's a very loose network um, happening in Canada of indigenous artists and groups working with and against artist-run culture and museums to really produce change um, to limited degrees of success. Um, but it is happening. I guess the question is like, <laughs> you know, what, what possibilities do you see in what you're already doing for expanding the scope beyond the institutions you're working with and really, you know, spreading that change? Yeah, I, can, I can maybe, maybe speak, speak a bit to that. I should uh, maybe, maybe stress within the, the national context that I'm working in that my museum, despite being a heritage museum, is like a periphery museum. Uh, in, internally there. It's, there's a clear hierarchy and we're not part of that. Uh, but what we hope to do is sort of open up a space of leverage and, and also to point out these sort of flaws and, and generally make, make, it, make life a bit more uncomfortable for, for certain other actors. Uh, in a Norwegian context, there's a, a new national museum being constructed now in Oslo, uh, the National Museum of Art, Architecture and Design. Uh, they were, uh, right before we launched our project, I was at a network meeting of directors, art museum directors in Norway at the National Museum where we got walked through the whole scale model of the new space and the permanent collection. There was not, a, everything was hanging in small one to 20 scale on the walls. There was not a single piece of Sami art. That's not going to be possible anymore mm -hmm. uh, when that new one opens now. Or at least, well, we'll wait and see. But it seems like it won't be possible anymore because of these types of actions. But it's, it's in a sense for me, we, what we need is more, there, there's certain spaces that carry great, far more symbolic weight than other ones. Uh, my institution carried 
a relatively high degree of symbolic weight, but still not enough. Uh, so to have this sort of intra-institutional, so, so we're looking at, to that, like if we can, if the Sami Dadi Museum project can reinvent itself version 2.0 in, for example, a Canadian space, or a US space, Australian space, New Zealand space, that would be great and also vice versa. So that you can keep keep creating these sort of new spaces of things. And that's really, really important. And it's, uh, I mean, because the National Galleries Canada, they have their curating positions in, in digital art, but I mean, th there's more work to be done there. Yeah. Do you have a question back there? Yeah. Um, uh, thank you, I really enjoyed the panel. And my question is regarding the last one, the Sami Museum. And you mentioned very briefly this idea of version two and three, but we live in a time that actually decolonization is on the, it's, a, it's on the rise, right? And there are lots of elite institutions that often hijack this discourse uh, mm -hmm. and kind of turn the whole practices into some sort of projectification of the whole struggle you know, and so on and so forth. So, um, so I'm wondering how your institution, not necessarily taken by it, but other, other institutions, would envision ideas of strategies that would fight or resist this projectification, right? Because there's a temporal politics involved in this. So this, uh, you did this for two months, and so I was wondering what happens after, what kind of strategies you have been thinking about that, you know, fight against this idea of projectification, that this was one thing, you know, done one time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, one, one clear, uh, there, there wasn't uh, time to go into too much detail of of course, I want other people in the panel to be able to tell us more about what they're doing. But there are certain moves that were very, very intentional curated. Like the, the project's not about me. The, the, I didn't even exist as the director. Lundros Kuntuzen disappeared. We had we had the Solomon performance artist as as the director of the symbol of the fictive institution. Uh, that's one way around it. The other way that it's a it is a, a completely open source project, so that other people need to take it forward and make it their own. It's not something that Nordos Kunstmuseum owns or even Lili Lundmuseum owns. That, that defeats the whole point. There's no sort of copyright on it. Uh, and it's also a project that has been owned by people before. There's been people maneuvering for us at Ivy Museum since 1970, right? And of course you acknowledge their existence and, and then you contribute to, to this and then the, the story goes, goes onwards. Uh, so you have to resist this sort of uh, resist the sort of commodification of this type of work and, and be very careful. There were a lot of institutions that got in touch immediately after we did this, wanting to, to bring the exhibition to their institutions, and there was just no way. It's not an exhibition. It's not a traveling exhibition. So sorry, we're not having that discussion. Yeah. So, 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 no exhibition. Yeah, yeah. So if, if you're going to do it, you have to, give, you have to give over your space. You have to become, and, and that's the point. And what is the space that doesn't exist in your city or town or whatever that you're not, that hasn't been allowed? And, and do that, that's the point. Otherwise it becomes aesthetic. And just a sort of model, I guess, like cookie cutting and repeating it. And then that, but of course that will probably happen too, so. <laughs> How would you combat that? Oh, it's the, it's the, it's the comment. Do you have another response? No, it's, 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 the classic, it's the classic problem of the avant-garde or the or radical yeah. practice. I mean, how, and that, that becomes a, how do you resist capitalism or something like that? Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't have that. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> it's, it's of course the, the same problematic space. Yeah. Thank you all for a wonderful um, portal into the world that you operate and share in. It seems. Maybe it's too much to ask, but you're working at the higher ed university level or a bit more with adults. And given all the funding cuts at elementary age um, and the importance of like, inclusivity and capturing children, I'm wondering if you have any collaborative or partnership with let's say elementary schools, Yale, Stanford, or what you do to capture the youth. I mean, it actually goes back to the question about uh, intra institutional um, issues as well. And I think that one has to step back and think you can't do everything, you can't scale it all up. I mean, it's with limited budgets trying to sort of work, you know, my idea is always to start within the university, then, you know, we're building up connections with other institutions along the East Coast and, you know, you just 
it, it's missionary work in some respects. Um, but actually, I might think, you know, seeing Miguel here, um, that what North Bennett Street School has done up in Boston in terms of uh, doing all sorts of pilot programs with sixth graders in Boston City Schools, it, there are things there, but it's not necessarily all linked together right now. It, everybody's working somewhat uh, independently uh, on the local level because that's where it's going to be effective. But it's again not thinking about not to belabor the point about the theme of the conference, but you know the idea of shared ground is something that is not simply where we are right now, but where we're going and how to keep the communication uh, going, addressing that broader kind of agenda. And, uh, I mean, from my perspective, I guess. Uh, so I've often been amazed by how much of an impact you can have just by putting something up on the web. And you always get these bizarre emails from people in every part of the world saying, oh, I saw your this and decided to do that. But um, in terms of trying to spread this model from higher ed now to inner city and, and, uh, and grade school, it occurs to me that the only organization that I take part in that has that kind of span is actually the school <coughs> You know, the, the National Council for Education and Experimental Arts, that annual meeting brings together a lot of K through 12 uh, teachers from all over and also academics and, and, and uh, people making a living as artists. So it's an interesting idea. I hadn't really thought out to that, that level yet, but yeah, it's something in the future that maybe we could try to perspective of people uh, to that venue. Uh, so I'll just join everyone else and thank you for a wonderful panel. Um, my question is a little bit more on the participant side, I guess. So the students who are in the classes, the people who are coming to the, to the spaces, uh, it's a very broad one, but some people, some of you spoke to it a little bit, but I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about what you think participants took away or were taking away from these experiences, and what were the limits of that? What were the things that you wanted them to, you wanted to teach and learn and see that maybe these, because of, because of institutional constraints maybe, or because of the space, or because of the temporalities, um, struggled to come across? Uh, I could jump in there. I, you know, I, I have come to realize that I think the reason why I like teaching these classes is that with students at a place like Stanford, especially when you talk about students in the STEM field, they get used to this model where you tell them a bunch of stuff that they're supposed to learn, and they learn it, and they get an A. But what really freaks them out about working in a ceramic studio is that you know, they keep asking me, am I doing this right? Or what's the next step? And I just have to tell them, well, it's not really like that. You just have to put in some time at the wheel getting used to this material and your own body mechanics, and you know, you'll figure it out. And it freaks them out. But, but to me, that's really, I think, the most important aspect of that is for them to have that, uh, to be in that uncomfortable place and to sort of see that there's this other kind of way of learning things. And that, yeah, you can know things that you don't know how to explain, and that's sort of, that's sort of natural. Um, you know, the other flip side of it is on a few occasions I've had art students come to these classes. And uh, I remember one particular student who I really liked who, who said that she was often told that her work was too tight. Um, you know, and so we went through a phase in that class where I really tried to dissuade her from thinking too much about what she was going to make before she started tearing up the clay. And so you know, there are little things like that. that uh, you know, I, as a scientist, I've always been jealous of seeing my colleagues in the humanities where when you ask them what their course is about, that has some bizarre esoteric title. They'll just say, well, really, I just want to, I'm teaching my students to read. So I think it's actually those kinds of basic things that, that I know are, well, you know, read in a deep way. But, you know, <laughs> I, you know, I think it's those kinds of things that I really hope students take away. Yeah, I would say it's, it's the messiness. Um, and what I talked about, the ineffability of materials. Um, you know, we live in a, in a time when we think we can control everything. Um, and I love the fact that, you know, I've done these teach-ins in which I've got one day of hands-on and usually a day of um, practice of exhibitions in museums and then a day um, in terms of getting at some of the issues that are primarily uh, lecture-based. And inevitably, what people come away from, the lectures are ephemeral. And what is real is what people said they've learned, actually you know, trying to hammer something, try to carve something. Watch, uh, or participating in, in a pour, or watching a CNC cutter, that's the stuff that they think of and they start transferring that into the ways that they see the world and start asking questions rather than just assuming the object is fixed and 
they can approach it visually or from, from the outside. And just as, as a further footnote, I mean, think about Tadeo's and what, how people respond. I mean, it's one thing to sort of have humanities and social science people, but having uh, some people from the School of Art um, in the MFA program. Um, I've even had somebody who had a lot of experience with Clay on Wednesday, and they got through with some of this, and they said they'd never, they'd only dry mixed clay before. They'd never sort of figured out ways of formulas and trying, you know, experimenting as they went, that it's all sort of prepackaged with a little bit of minor variation, and it just opened up a whole new world to her um, that hadn't been on the radar at all. You know, your question actually made me start thinking about how uh, oftentimes when you're trying to get support for these sorts of uh, participatory projects, especially when they're community-based, um, funding sources want to know what your outcomes are in advance. And you are then often <coughs> you know, subject to trying to somehow create an argument for the efficacy and the measure, you know, the metrics of how much you altered the lives of these individuals. <laughs> so, you know, it, I mean, I, it's a source of frustration, it's also a source of possibility. And I, I think for me, um, the key has been that uh, the people that I work with on the ground there are already invested in these kinds of activities. So they're the ones who have the kids programs, for example, teaching kids how to read. They have, you know, they, they're already doing these things. And so our collaboration ends up being about um, moments of keeping an ongoing dialogue so that when they're noticing something that's a weak link in their system or when I see something really exciting that I think they would become excited about. That's when the cross crossing occurs. So for example, in this project, I would never have predicted that the outcome, one of the outcomes this time, was that they came to me afterwards and said, you know, we did this whole thing, and yet the art, critical art writing is so weak in this region that people don't know how to talk about this kind of work. So can you come back and help us work on a, a critical writing workshop or a series of workshops so we can start to work more effectively with the students that, because they're not getting it at the Art Academy there. And they don't, you know, and so who would have known that? I mean, I came there to do textile history at the Silk Museum and now, and, but they do have in the museum a collective of young art historians and art writers who want to do something and who are beginning to do podcasts and different kinds of things, but they just haven't been in dialogue. So anyway, it's sometimes unpredictable. I think we might want to wrap it up. Okay, I think we're out of time. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you.